Hi, so this is the first video for chapter 12. And chapter 12 is all about trying to measure the effects of oligopoly and market power in uh, various industries. And we've seen a lot of different models so far, right? Starting uh, with chapter nine, where we did the uh, cartel model, where firms collude. Um, and we said, you know, those are not always successful. They're more likely to be successful when they're legal or if there's just a few firms. Um, and then we talked about the Corneau and Bertrand model, both in a static setting in chapter 10 and then in a dynamic setting in chapter 11. Um, and the obvious difference is that in the Corneau model, uh, market power falls with the number of firms uh, increasing. Whereas in a Bertrand model, all you need is two firms as long as uh, goods are homogeneous and you get the perfectly competitive market. So in this chapter, we're going to talk about ways to measure market power um, in industries and we'll think about both a static setting and a dynamic setting although as we'll see it's not always easy to uh, figure out when firms have market power and when they do not so if we think about all right well how much market power uh, does a firm have you know obviously we would like to think about how do their prices compare with their marginal costs and if prices are uh, much higher than marginal costs and much higher than average costs as well depending on the type of market then that's an argument that there should be some regulation there, right? Either maybe there's a monopoly or there's a cartel um, or there's just not enough competition and it's harming society and we should do something about it. Um, the problem, of course, is that we often don't have uh, great data. Even marginal cost is something that can be very difficult to measure. Um, but we can do our best using econometric techniques and we're gonna talk about some of those measurements and techniques uh, in this chapter. So the most common measure that we've talked about already is the learner index. Um, and we talked about that in the static setting. The learner index is just um, defined as price minus marginal cost divided by price. So you can think of it as uh, you know, a type of markup over marginal cost. Um, and then that can also be defined as one over eta, where eta is the absolute value of the price elasticity of demand. Um, and remember, the price elasticity of demand is how much uh, quantity demand changes due to a percent change in the price. So when firm demand is perfectly elastic, so like we have in perfect competition, then price equals marginal cost, right? So the learner index is equal to zero. Um, and But when there are fewer substitutes, the price elasticity of demand falls and the degree of market power increases, right? So if, if you have a unique product uh, that people can't get anywhere else, you're going to have a much higher learner index um, and much more market power. And it's going to max out at one, right, the learner index, because if you think uh, as marginal cost gets smaller and smaller compared to price, P over P, it just becomes one. So it varies between zero and one. So with the learner index, um, that can really depend on technology. And by technology, what we mean is um, both you know, the cost function of the firm and also even the demand function uh, of the firm. Um, so we give an example here of a monopolist with a linear demand uh, and cost function. So we have sort of our standard uh, inverse demand P equals A minus Q. Um, we've gotten rid of the B here and then total costs are just marginal cost times Q. And in this case, uh, that gives our monopoly quantity is A minus MC over two and our monopoly price is A plus MC over two. And so we can calculate the learner index in this case, it's just A minus MC over A plus MC. Um, so this implies that market power actually diminishes as marginal cost increases. So as marginal cost becomes a, a larger and larger piece uh, of your costs, um, your market power is going to decrease. And really it's a, what it is, is in relation to A. And remember, A is that sort of maximum willingness to pay in your inverse demand function. Um, and also keep in mind that demand elasticity is not constant when we have a linear uh, demand curve. And so eta increases as Q star declines. Um, so that's an important thing to remember. And so both demand and technology uh, can determine market power. You can be a monopolist that has very little market power if you face a very uh, elastic demand curve. So if we think about it in an oligopoly setting with, with N firms, um, the way the book defines it is they take this, you know, 
first order condition, um, and they get this term theta. And so theta um, here is uh, what they call the behavioral parameter of market power. And so you can see we can have price plus this um, theta times the change in price over the change of quantity times quantity is equal to marginal cost. And so what we'll see is that in perfect competition, theta is going to be equal to zero. Um, with a monopoly, it's going to be equal to one, and it's going to vary depending on the type of setting that we have. Um, and if we have some basic assumptions, mostly homogeneous goods, then we get that the learner index is uh, varies in relation to theta. So the learner index is equal to theta times uh, divided by the number of firms n times uh, eta, the price elasticity of demand, the absolute value. Um, or we can think of it as the market share of firm I times theta over eta. Um, so if we think about the learner index in different types of oligopoly, as we said, you know, in the last slide, that theta is going to be equal to zero in perfect competition, right? And price is just going to equal marginal cost. But then, of course, it will also equal zero in a Bertrand equilibrium with homogeneous goods because uh, price equals marginal cost as well there. Um, in the Cournot equilibrium, uh, theta equals one. Um, and so the learner index is just the market share over eta or one uh, divided by n times eta. And so the learner index will be decreasing uh, as n increases, which is what we said with, with Cournot, right? It gets closer and closer to perfect competition uh, as the number of firms increases. Um, and then, of course, when n is equal to 1, we just get the monopoly outcome. Um, and then in a perfect cartel, theta equals n and L equals 1 over uh, eta. So we can think of theta as an indicator of the toughness of competition, but it's an inverse, right? So the degree of competition increases as theta decreases. Um, so perfect competition, theta is equal to 0. Uh, and then as theta increases, um, we get more, we get less competition, right? More market power. So the other um, measurement for uh, market power or market concentration, really, that we had is the Herfindahl-Hirschman index, or HHI, um, which equals one over n in a symmetric uh, oligopoly. And so in this case, the learner index uh, we can think of as just theta times HHI over eta. Um, and so we can say, all right, well, market power then increases either as concentration increases, right? HHI increases. A higher value of HHI means a higher learner index. Um, demand becomes less price elastic, right? So a, a more inelastic demand, a steeper slope of the demand curve, that would be eta decreasing, or competition diminishes, right? And so theta increases. Um, all of those are going to increase market power, increase firms' ability to charge a price above marginal cost, right? And remember, that's what that learner index is measuring. So obviously, we have been talking mostly about homogeneous goods, um, but products may be heterogeneous. Firms may not be symmetric. We may have some firms that are larger than other firms. Um, and even with homogeneous goods, firms may have different costs. Um, so we might have a cost leader um, in the market that just is more productive. Uh, calculating the learner index in this case is hard. Um, we could do a weighted average, right, where we take uh, each firm's market share and then price minus marginal cost divided by price for each firm. But we often don't have uh, that data. And marginal cost is not always observable unless it equals average cost, right? Remember, marginal cost is that cost of producing one more unit. Uh, and usually what we can observe in the data is actually average cost, which is just total cost divided by um, uh, quantity. And that's not always, those two are not always going to be equal. In fact, often cases and oftentimes they will not be equal. An additional complication is when we're in a dynamic setting, right? And so this is a much more advanced topic, uh, much more theoretical. We're not going to go through it here. Um, but a statter learner index might be biased. Um, it might be a biased estimate of market power really in either direction uh, in a dynamic setting. So the example they give in the book is the case of cigarettes. Um, and so you might say, all right, I'm going to give away my cigarettes for free or for a very low price um, in order to hook new customers and uh, or intensify a pre-existing addiction. 
And then tomorrow I'm going to be able to hike the price um, and boost overall profit. So if we try to measure market power today, when I'm giving away cigarettes, it's going to look like I don't have any market power. But the fact is I'm going to have a lot more market power um, in the future. Um, and that can be true also when we're thinking about sort of, you know, potential entrance into a market um, or we're thinking about now, you know, potential international competition. All of the dynamic issues are going to make it a, a lot more complicated. So because marginal cost is often not easily available, there are a lot of other measures of market power, which we'll just sort of run through quickly here. Um, one of the most common in financial economics is Tobin's Q. And Tobin's Q is defined as the market value of the firm uh, divided by the replacement value of the firm's assets. So let's think about that for a moment. So the market value is basically just the share price times all of the shares, right? And that gives you your market value. Say it's $2 billion. Um, and then the replacement value of the firm's assets is how much would you have to spend to buy all of these assets um, if they all disappeared? And if that's the same, right, then that will just be equal to one. And that basically means the firm has really no market power, right? The, the market value is just equal to the replacement value. But if a firm is able to earn positive economic profits, then Tobin's Q will exceed one, right? Because the firm now is more valuable than its replacement cost. It's able to uh, generate economic profits, which is that extra value. And that's why Tobin's Q uh, might be useful. It's also really easy to measure, which is another nice thing. Um, other measures of market power are more focused on profitability, um, although you could certainly argue that Tobin's Q uh, reflects profitability as well. Uh, one example is the firm's uh, profit rate or rate of return, which is just the ratio of the amount earned per dollar invested in the company for a given time period. Um, and so the idea is that there's gonna be some normal rate of return in the economy, R star, but if a firm is earning positive economic profits, then there are, their rate of return will exceed uh, the normal rate of return, R star. Uh, similar to that is the profit to sales ratio. Um, so this is defined as profit divided by total revenue. Uh, so just total revenue minus total cost, that's profit divided by total revenue. Uh, it's easy to measure. Um, so it's frequently used in, in the business literature. Um, and if we're at our long run equilibrium and firms uh, operate in um, a constant returns to scale uh, production technology, then it will be equal to the learner index theoretically. So um, that can be nice. And it's just it's easily it's more easily available. Right. A lot of these measures are just much more easily available. And so that's why they're often used. Um, one thing that we want to be careful of is to be wary of accounting profits. Right. So. Accounting profits are what we see in firms' uh, financial reports. Um, so they're easy to get. They are um, straightforward. But one of the problems is that um, market power is normally associated with sort of long run economic profit, um, but not always, right? We said monopolistic competition firms have market power. They can set the price above marginal cost, but their long run profits are zero. Um, so they don't actually have long run profits. Um, second, if you have a diversified firm, right? It's difficult to identify the revenues, costs, and assets that are associated with each market, right? So if you think about, um, you know, Coca-Cola, they're in the soft drink firms, they're in uh, the water, market, they're in juice market. And so all of those might get mixed together and they might have more market power in, you know, the soda firm and soda market, excuse me, than they do in like the juice market, for example. Um, and then accounting profits are not always a good proxy for economic profits. And one of the reasons for that is that physical capital is typically valued incorrectly at its historical cost, right? So how much you paid for it rather than its opportunity cost. Um, Investments that provide future benefits like advertising or research and development might be incorrectly treated as a current expense, especially things like advertising. Um, and so and it's also almost impossible to get an accurate estimate of the economically relevant depreciation rate for each of those expenditures. Right. So how how quickly really is the physical capital um, depreciating? 
the firm will depreciate it based on accounting rules, but those aren't necessarily the same as the economic depreciation. And then finally, uh, one more measure is the index of relative profit, profit differences or just RPD. Um, now to use RPD to determine sort of the degree of competition, we have to have two conditions hold. First, firms uh, must, within the same industry, must have different levels of efficiency. So this actually you do, does usually hold. Um, there are usually efficient firms and less efficient firms and the efficient firms will be more profitable. And second, an increase in competition. So, you know, whatever that increase in competition is must punish inefficient firms more harshly than it punishes efficient firms. So as an example, let's say an industry opens up to international competition, uh, that would be an increase in competition. It has to punish the firms that are at the bottom of the productivity ladder in that industry more than uh, the ones at the top. In fact, the ones at the top might benefit from that. Um, so RPD compares the variable profits of different firms um, and has several desirable qualities. So first variable profit data are readily available so we can look at those um, for publicly owned firms. Uh, it's approximately equal to gross operating profit which is just revenue minus cost of goods sold. Um, second, we can use variable profits which circumvents the measurement problems associated with accounting profits. Um, and then third, data are needed for at least three firms in the industry, but are not required for every firm, right? So we don't need, if there's 20 firms in the industry, we don't need the data for all of them uh, necessarily. And so that makes it a little bit easier to calculate. So it's just something, just another measurement that you might come across that you should be aware of. 